Hi folks, uh, tonight's video we're going to talk a little bit about some examples of taking the discrete time Fourier transform for some simple finite length signals. Uh, just basic things coming right from the definition of the transform, but it's good to, to see how this happens. Again, we remember the definition of the discrete time Fourier transform is that we say that x of e to the j omega is equal to the sum as n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of x of n e to the minus j omega n. And in this, this equation, the, uh, the frequency itself is, in, is this omega. So we write the, uh, it, it's maybe not obvious when you're not used to it, but the frequency variable up here is the omega in the exponent. So this is really a function of omega. And we write it this way to remind ourselves that o omega for the discrete time Fourier transform, omega repeats every 2 pi. So that's a very imp important fact. For, the, for discrete time, the Fourier transform repeats every 2 pi in omega. Okay, and so this is actually a function that's periodic in omega, and that's why we write it this way, because we've already seen the complex exponential in this form repeats every 2 pi in its argument. And so this is reminding us of that. So what that means in equation form, right, is what that's saying, is if I go over here, is that means that x of e to the j omega is equal to x of e to the j omega plus 2 pi. And that's the reason for writing it this way instead of just writing x of omega. So let's see a, an example of how that actually actually works out here. So here's my uh, first example. It's to find x1 of n to be the uh, signal, I'll, I'll give it an equation from form first and then draw it. So it's delta of n plus 3 plus delta of n minus 3. So if I were to draw this, we know that the delta function is 0 everywhere except when its argument is equal to 0. So this argument will be 0. Let me sort of flag these with colors. So this here will be 0 when n equals minus 3. Right? This is a pulse at n equals minus 3. And this one is a pulse at n equals 3, because that's the value of n that makes this argument 0. So I could actually sort of, maybe I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll treat this one as, as the red one from now on. And this one is the blue one. So if I were going to actually draw this and say, where, what is each term contributing to? Here at n equals 3, I have a height 1 pulse. Get that and here at, at n equals minus 3, I also have a height 1 pulse. And then everywhere in between, not quite sure this is quite to scale, but this is the main point. Oh, you know, it is. I got it right. All right, so this is my x1 of n. Everywhere else, this thing is 0. And so now I'm going to, I want to find x of e to the j omega here. So again, for x, we'll call it x sub 1, since this is x1 of n. I just start from the definition. So again, sum of x of n, e to the minus j omega n, as n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. But x of x, again, it should be x1 of n here x1 of n is 0 almost everywhere. There are only two terms in this sum that aren't 0. Right? When n equals minus 3, I'll have 1 times e to the j omega 3, right? Because when n here is minus 3, these two minus signs cancel out, and I'm left with that. And then I'll have another term from the blue pulse here will contribute a term that's 1 times e to the minus j omega 3. 
right? Because again, when n is plus 3, this term becomes 1 for the amplitude, and then the exponential is still there. We uh, scoot up the screen a little bit here. And now we recognize this is our old form Euler's equation, just to my timer out of the way. If I just can simplify it one step at a time, I say, well, this is e to the j omega 3 plus e to the minus j omega 3. So the Fourier transform for this is, well, this is 2 times cosine of 3 omega. All right, so anytime I have the sum of two exponentials the posit with a positive exponent and then the opposite negative exponent, Euler's formula, says that's 2 times the cosine of the, of the exponent. And so this will be 2 cos ome 3 omega. And in fact, I, would, I should expect this to be real, right? One of the important symmetry properties is that if x of n is even symmetric, which this is, right? It's, it's the same on the positive and negative side. If I folded this over the origin, I'd get the same signal back. So it's a real even signal. I should get a real even Fourier transform. And I do here. So this cosine is, is real. It raises a question about what would it look like if, if it weren't uh, an even symmetric one. Why don't we try a little different one? So we get a new page for this. So for our next example, be uh, example two. If I pick x2 of n to be equal to, uh, let's say, oh, and I can even do this color-coded right from the start. So let's do this with the red. So I have a pulse, let's say 2 delta of n plus 5, and then we'll do the other pulse in blue. So again, two pulses, but what if it's not, instead of being even symmetric, this would be what I would call odd symmetric, right? I have another pulse with amplitude minus 2 at n equals plus 5. So again, this is the pulse at n equals minus 5, because that's what makes this argument 0. This is the pulse at n equals plus 5. So again, if I were going to draw this, Spread it out a little bit and count out from the middle. So if this is 0, I have 0 at 1, 2, 3, 4, as I go to the positive side. And then right here at n equals 5, I have a pulse of height minus 2. And on beyond that, going back in negative time, again, I'll have 0 all the way out until I get to minus 5. Oh, and here, I have a pulse of height 2. And then 0 outside of this region, right? So two deltas, or two unit impulses, provide two samples in my signal. And unlike the last one, these are this is symmetric about the origin, but they're opposite, equal and opposite signs. So that tells me from Fourier transform properties, I should expect something that's actually imaginary. So this should be a, a Fourier transform that's imaginary and, and an odd symmetry. Let's see how that works out from the sum. So now if I want to find the Fourier transform, I start with the same sum, x2 of e to the j omega. The sum as n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of x2 of n e to the minus j omega n. And again, all the terms in this sum are going to be 0 except just these two values. When n equals minus 5, keeping my color-coded scheme going to help you see where each term comes from. So when n equals minus 5, I get 2 e to the j 5 omega. And when n equals plus 5, I get a minus 2 e to the minus j 5 omega. And so, and all the other terms are in the sum are 0. So this is very simple. Scrolling up a bit oh, to make some more room. That didn't work.
And again, this is the other Euler's identity, right? This is the Euler's identity that says I've got the difference of two complex exponentials where they have the same imaginary exponent but with opposite signs. So when I subtract this from this, one of my essential math facts, I end up with, well, I factor the 2 out front maybe just to make this a little clearer. So I have 2 e to the j, 5 omega, minus e to the minus j, 5 omega. Well, then the term in the brackets becomes 2j times sine of 5 omega. So putting that all together, I have j times the 4 times the sine of 5 omega. So as I expected from the odd symmetry, I have a purely imaginary Fourier transform. And because sine is an odd function in omega, right, this is an odd function in omega, this would end up being uh, an odd imaginary function, as we expect from a real odd signal. Let's do one last example that isn't exactly even or odd, but does still have some symmetry and see how that works out. So one, one new page here. And let's think about example three here. What if my, my third signal, x3 of n, is equal to, uh, say, 3 times delta of n minus 2 plus, uh, say, 7 times delta of n minus 4 plus 3 times delta of n minus 6. So again, if I draw this signal out, make a quick sketch. This one is not symmetric at the origin, right? It, this is going to be a pulse at time 3, or, I'm sorry, time 2, because when n equals 2, this argument is 0. So I have something of height 3 here at time 2, and then nothing at 3, and then something at time 4, that's this pulse here, become, oops, I'm sorry, becomes a height 7. Then another 0 at 5, and then this one becomes height 3 again. So sort of rough, not perfectly to scale, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like. All right, so this is my sketch of x3 of n. So this signal, if I look at this for a minute, and I have some practice with this, one thing I do want to pick up on is I do have some symmetry, it's just not symmetric about the origin. And that's going to be important, that's going to tell me how to turn it into a simpler form. But let's for now begin just with the straight definition. So x3 of e to the j omega, the same definition we've used in both the previous examples, as the sum as n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, of x3 of n e to the minus j omega n. And as we've seen twice before, there are only going to be three non-zero terms here. I didn't take the time to color code this one. But I have 3 times e to the j minus 2 omega, right? That's the term that comes from n equals 2, plus 7 times e to the minus j 4 omega, plus 3 times e to the minus j 6 omega. So that's my Fourier transform, in a, in a strict sense, this is uh, an answer, but it's, it's, but it's not really much of a solution, and it doesn't give me much understanding of how this thing behaves. And one thing that will be very helpful as we go on thinking about things in the frequency domain and Fourier transforms is to be able to get them in terms of, of fa a product of a phase term and an amplitude or magnitude. And where that's going to come from, actually, if I, if I highlight this for a second, is recognizing that I've, bah, that's not a pen, Sorry, a little vertigo there. Let's go back to the pen. So if I go look at this signal, the key thing to recognize is that I have this symmetry about n equals 4 here. And so that, if I have a point of symmetry, that tells me something about what I want to factor out here to be able to use Euler's equation. And let me uh, show you how this goes. If I rearrange the terms down here a bit and rewrite, I'm going to pull the, I'm going to put these, uh, terms with amplitude 3 together, because the goal is to get those 
eventually into something. I've got a sum of two exponentials, but I can't use Euler's formula right away because I don't have equal and opposite exponents. But I'd like to get there. So let me start by saying, well, what happens if I pull this one out front? And then I say I have 3 times e to the minus j 2 omega and plus e to the minus j 6 omega. Whenever I have things like this, I should be looking for ways to balance them out. We mentioned this by factoring out the, the average of the two phases. So something halfway between minus j2 omega and minus 6 omega would be minus 4 omega. So let me pull that out in front of the whole thing. So when I do that, this first one leaves 7. This one leaves 3 times e to the j2 omega, right? Because if I multiply these back out, I would add the exponents and get e to the minus j2 omega. And then this one similarly leaves e to the minus j2 omega. So again, if I multiply these two back out, I'd have minus 2 omega and minus 4, I'm sorry, minus 4 omega and minus 2 omega would be minus 6 omega. And so it looks like magic at first, but once a little practice, you get used to looking for things that are symmetric and pulling out the, the thing that's halfway between the exponents, right? Halfway between minus j2 omega and minus j6 omega is minus j4 omega. And this 4 isn't an accident. It comes, again, just scrolling back up from this symmetry up here. So now I have things in a form where I can use Euler's to simplify it a bit. Let's so make a little more room here. So I can use Euler's formula. Well, there's nothing to do for the first term. Or the 7. Right? The 7 is what it is. But this becomes 2 times 3 cos 2 omega. And the reason we like this turns out to be a very useful form to put things in is I can sort of highlight these two separate forms. This thing out front has magnitude 1. So this is, so it's magnitude equals 1. So this is in fact just a phase term. Right. In fact, I could show this is this is telling me that the phase of this signal is going to be what we call a linear phase signal. If I work through taking the arctangent of this, or just recognizing that this is in polar form, right? For a complex number, this will be minus four omega. So the phase of the signal is minus four omega. I get that directly from that. I don't have to worry about the phase here because this thing is real. Right. It's just seven plus six cos two omega, and so that's. The other piece, maybe if I use green to highlight this, is this the second bracket here. This thing is all real, which means the phase for something real is equal to zero. Right? That something right on the real axis has zero phase. But this tells me what the magnitude is. Right? So this says the magnitude of this signal, or the, I'm sorry, the magnitude of the Fourier transform is seven plus 6 cos 2 omega. Right? And so there, there's no phase. And this is, again, the reason we like to organize it this way is it lets us worry about one thing at a time. If I'm worrying in a pro working on a problem where magnitude is important, I can do this and think about this term. And if I'm worrying about the phase, I can do that. If they're both important, I can still generally deal with them one at a time this way. And again, this, is, this linear phase comes out of the symmetry. So whenever I see some symmetry in the si signal, even if it's not symmetric in the origin, it tells me I should be able to end up with something that, that's in this form here times a, a complex exponential related to where that center of symmetry is. Okay, so there's some overview on some simple Fourier transform signals. Uh, do some other examples with, uh, as soon as I can with geometric and, and an inverse Fourier transform as well. Have a good night.